gratitude following the amazing Easter Sunday last week. Why don't we give it all up for our team? Kids, Under the title called Pre 
and the man became a living being. The first mention of God breathing two chapters in. He creates man and in order for man to be alive he needed one element out of this incredible creation and God breathed into his nostrils and gave him what he called the breath of life. Now the breath of life is interesting because the breath of life makes you alive but it doesn't mean that you are living. You say, how do you work that one out? Well, that's simple. Because a kangaroo has the breath of life. It has a heart, lungs. It requires oxygen to jump around, to box. A kangaroo has the same breath of life as you do. You realize that your grandmother might be 95. She still has the breath of life after 95 years. God wants you to know your breath is a gift from God. Now I know some of you believe that you're God and God isn't God, you're God. But you know that man cannot even recreate the breath of life. He can put you on a ventilator, he can put you on an artificial system to make you breathe. To resuscitate you. But the moment they unplug the machine. If the breath of life has gone out of you. Nobody can recreate the breath of God that came upon you. Every animal. So your grandmother may. Has still the breath of life if she's alive. If she's not she doesn't. A newborn baby the moment he comes out of the mother's womb and. Gets his bottom smacked and make it cry. Little does that baby know that's the start of things to come, having his bottom smacked. <laughs> the first thing that the parent and the midwife is looking for is that gasp, the breath of life. You know your dog has the breath of life. So does your pet hamster. Every animal has it. Every living being has the breath of life. It's what sustains us. That being said, I know some of you would like your dog's life whereby you sit and beg, you get fed, taking a walk, throwing a ball, then you sleep, wake up, get fed again, it all happens again. Dog doesn't have to go to work. All it does is look to human beings. Maybe some of you would like to be your cat. Just sleeping all day. On the best part of the house. In the bed. On the sofa. Reserved for only humans. And your cat has become like the king of the castle. But I want you to see this. That because by virtue of the breath of life. Is in an animal as well as you. It doesn't equate that the breath of life actually helps you to live the way you should. A cat doesn't have a destiny, apart from he's been, been given apparently nine lives. But you do. So there has to be something else. So God breathed in us. Say in us. From that moment, we keep breathing until the day comes for us to be thrust into eternity when we leave this body and our spirit lives on. For those who trust Jesus in heaven, for those who don't in hell, read your Bible. Oh, don't shoot the messenger, just read the Bible. But then amazing things happen, stay with me. So let me ask you this question. Do you have the breath of life, but you still are not alive? You aren't thriving. You're surviving. You're not flourishing.
flourishing, you're floundering. You're breathing, but you're hardly on fire. It takes everything you have in your being to roll out of bed in the morning, get yourself dressed, have your Weetabix, and sigh. Oh, not another day. Come on. You have the breath of life. You're alive. What's the other option? To be dead. You have the breath of life. But you know, something happened at the resurrection of the Easter weekend that we need to see. Because today is a day when I believe that God wants to fill every new believer and every not so new believer. You say, what do you mean new believer? Those who gave their lives to Jesus last weekend. Many of them. You're here today. And you go, oh, that was... That was like the end for me, you know, I gave my life to Jesus, that's it now, it's done. Now I get on with my life, no, that was the beginning. You've already got the breath of life. So what clue does the second breath in the Bible give to us as new believers or old believers? You could have been a Christian for 60 years and still have no clue about the power of what I'm talking about. In John chapter 20... Jesus has died. He's been resurrected. He's come back. And if you don't know the Bible, that's fine. You'll get to know it. God won't read it for you. You have to read it yourself. But just to give you some context, when Jesus was raised from the dead, Long story short, he comes back and over a period of 40 days, that's over a month obviously, he appears to 500 different people. He appears in his resurrected body to 500 people more than. 40 days later, he ascends to heaven and the disciples say, Lord, don't leave us alone. It's a bit like saying Easter's over. Oh, what are we going to do now? Don't leave us alone. And so after the 40 days, Jesus ascends. And he said, now go and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we know from Scripture that when you had 40 days, they waited 10 days in the upper room. And Jesus walks through the wall, appears to them. And after 10 days, they received the promised Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a mathematician, you'll know that 40 plus 10 equals 50. Even though it never did for me at school. 50, we get the word pente. Five, the pentagon. Pentecostal. Pentecost, meaning 50, on the 50th day after the resurrection of Christ, we talked about the same power that raised Christ from the dead, enters that room, and we're going to read it here, and it's from John, chapter 20, just a couple of verses, so you ready? On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, this is during the ten days of waiting, when the disciples were together, and the doors were locked for fear of the Jews and the Jewish leaders, Jesus came. And by the way, you can lock him out all you like, but he has a way of barging in. Thank God he interrupted my life. I got my life all sorted out. This is my dream, God. This is what I'm going to do. And you can lock him out. So, for fear, and Jesus comes. It doesn't say how, but he obviously is not bothered about a locked door. 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again said, Jesus, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. One of the first things that when you allow Jesus through your locked door, he will give you a double portion of peace that you've never known before. But notice this, and with that, only the second time, first in the old, now in the new, he breathed on them, does it sound familiar? And said, receive the Holy Spirit. So right at the beginning of the Bible, God breathes in them, and now at the beginning of the early church, Jesus breathes on them. And you receive the breath of life the first time, but the second time, when Jesus breathes on you the Holy Spirit, He breathes on you to empower you to live the new life that you have. Without the power of the Holy Spirit breathe, being breathed on you, you will be like a chainsaw without fuel being started. You will be chopping down trees by your own strength, not realizing that you can actually start it and there's power. And some of you have been struggling since the day that you believed because you thought this is hard work. Well, it's never easy to live as a Christian. But Jesus wants that same power that raised Christ from the dead to be part of your life. This breathing on business is all to empower them. So we find even like Peter, pathetic Peter, powerfully preaches at Pentecost. All the peace. Why you say pathetic? Because a few days earlier, pathetic Peter can't even stand up to a young servant girl and say, Hey, I belong to Jesus. She said, You belong to Jesus. He said, No, I don't. And he blasphemed and swore at even a young servant girl. That's how pathetic he is. Is he a believer? Yes. Is he a pathetic one? Yes. How? What? Who, where, when, what happened? Jesus breathed on him and he suddenly starts to be empowered to live this life. So we get the first breath, the breath of life, gives us life to breathe, to live, to do our own thing. God doesn't take away your breath until the last day that you die. But he wants you to know, as a believer in Christ, if you gave your life to Jesus last weekend, if you did it publicly, if you've done it privately, you need to know what I never knew as a new Christian and as a young Christian, that there was a power that God wanted to give to me, to empower me to serve him and to love him. When I worked for Dudley Catering Department, as a supervisor, I had to travel around lots of different places. Whenever the head cook was away on holiday or sick, I, I was one of eight supervisors that got sent in, and so I go to various places. And I still pass by today the one place where I never forget when the power of God, the Holy Spirit, came upon me. He breathed on me. And I went from this shy, reserved young man to being able to hold this full-blown testimony conversation of the power of God. And I worked at an old people's home, the largest in the borough, 70 beds. There were tens and tens of staff that worked there. And I didn't know, but all of them had been observing my life in the kitchen as they came in day after day after day. I didn't even know they were looking. But the officer in charge said to me one day, Mark, we want you tomorrow to hold a staff meeting with all of the staff of this home. 
There were 50, 60 staff. They said, we want to hear your story because everybody's talking about what you have as a Christian. Now they knew about it because I had spoken, God had given me a couple of words of knowledge for staff in the home, which wasn't the particular thing to do. I ended up in front of the big boss going to the office in Dudley, number five, Edna Road, Dudley. And she said to it's a woman built like a tank, I have to say, everybody feared her. She called me one day and she told me, under no circumstances will you ever witness about Jesus again while you're working here. Well, there's a time to obey your boss and there's a time not to. I decided I'd rather obey God than obey this woman. I didn't plan to say what I'm about to say, but I just came into my mind, so maybe I should be saying this. And so the day came, I'm sort of in my chef's whites and my chef's hat, and they say, now is the time of the staff meeting. They closed the home down and brought all of the staff in. I don't know what the residents were doing, but all the staff were crammed into the staff room. And they said, you've got 30 minutes to tell us about Jesus. That same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. Now the third breath is very important because he breathed in us, he breathes on us. And the third one, he breathes for us. 2 Timothy 3.16 And when I say he breathes for us, I don't mean he's like a life support machine, but he is. And it says this in 2 Timothy 3.16, this is my Bible. It says this, all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. Some of you believe that men wrote this book, and they did. They did. But God breathed on those men. God breathes on people today. And he wants you to know that this is your oxygen for your soul. He won't read it for you, you have to read it. If you want to recall what the Bible says, you have to read the Bible to recall what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is the greatest power in the universe, but He can't read the Bible for you. You have to read it. He will then remind you of it. All Scripture is what? God breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. In fact, this is the book of life. This is the book that you get. So that when you've got the breath of life in you given by God in Genesis and you get the Holy Spirit breathing upon you, you have to receive oxygen daily. That's why the first thing I do apart from drink tea in the morning is this. I open the Bible because I need oxygen for the day. I need the breath of God upon me today. I need the breath of God on my life today. Some of you feel like you are encased in a tomb. And that's because you've stopped taking in oxygen. Some of you have got headaches. Some of you feel as if all the life has gone from you. Because you didn't realize that this book here is not a storybook. This is not some kind of book that you can pick up and throw away. This is a book that's going to keep reading you when you read it. This is the Word of God. This is the breath of God. He breathed on this book. God breathed on this book. That's why this book is unique. You put it on your coffee table and you go, oh, I'll just put it over there for another week. And it keeps speaking to you. And you have to pick it up again. And some of you are wondering, why can't I get rid of the Bible? Why is it that I can't shake it off? Because it's the breath of God. God breathed on this word. From Genesis to Revelation, His name, His DNA is all over this word. Now I want to finally show you, before we pray this morning, Breathe. Breathe. Let me show you what happens when God breathes upon you. I'm going back to Genesis. Some of you love the Old Testament. Oh, I, I like the Old Testament. Well, it's all the book of God. Some of you go, oh, I don't like the Old Testament. I don't understand it. Well, you will today. Pastor Gillian is fantastic at preaching the Old Testament. She really is. Here we have it. When Abraham was 99 years old. Come on, there's hope for everybody here today. 
the Lord appeared to him. By the way, those of you who are over 70, between 70 and 101, I think today, God still will appear to you. And said, I am God Almighty. I am what the Hebrews call El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will greatly increase in numbers. Excuse me, God, we can't even have a baby. How on earth are we going to do that? Abraham fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be, what age did we say he was? Ninety-nine. God is speaking to a 99-year-old shriveled up man. You will be the father. Now what are we left? Of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham. The addition of a letter. And I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you at 99 very fruitful. I will make nations of you, old man. And kings will come from you, old man. I will establish my covenant as I have everlasting covenant between me and you. And your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner. I will give you an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. Abraham. You ready? We're coming into close. Abraham was his name. It's very interesting to notice that in the Hebrew alphabet, the word or the letter H is pronounced He. 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 And it means breath. Try saying He. Without breath. It is created. H. E. H. H. It's impossible even as a black countryite. You can't say it. That's your and my language. But we have to say in Hebrew. H. Which means. That each letter signifies something and it signifies breath. So Abraham gets a name change before he gets a promise coming to him. Yeah. And God said, I'm going to add head to your life. I'm going to change you from Abraham to Abraham. Because I need to put my breath on your life. And some of you have been waiting. Abraham for 25 years, a quarter of a century, ladies and gentlemen, young people, boys and girls here today, a quarter of a century, God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Now, Abraham, Abraham means exalted father. That's what he was. He was looked up to. But Abraham doesn't mean exalted father. It means exalted father of the multitudes. God said, when my breath touches you, I don't care how long the promise has been. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care how mentally deranged you are. I don't care how much epilepsy you have. But God breathes his head upon you. Come on, David, come and join me. Come on, everybody, let's have a party in this place tonight. And when the breath of God comes upon you, he changes your dynamic. He changes your destiny. He breathes upon you and said, I know it's been a long wait. There are three people, three ladies, married ladies here, and privately are struggling to have children. When the breath of God in this service comes upon you today, you will be fruitful. The breath of God. 
Have we not quite done there? We're coming into land this morning. Because there's another scripture when we skip to Genesis. I believe it's Genesis 17, is it? God also said to Abraham. He never takes him back to Abraham again. Read the Bible. Read Genesis 17, the cutoff point, when God says, Her. Yeah. There's no going back. Oh, but what if it doesn't work? Well, you're going back, but God's not going back. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, which means princess, you are no longer to be called Sarai or Sarah. Her name will be Sarah.
I can't escape it. I'm alive. 